This Sunday, the January 6 hearings. Hold the order! Hold the order! Hold the order! President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. The evidence it represents Senate Trump's last stand, most desperate chance to halt the transfer of power. A sophisticated seven part plan to overturn the presidential election and prevent the transfer of presidential power. The election lies. I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was bull. The riot. I was slipping in people's blood. It was carnage. It was chaos. And the warning. I say this to my Republican colleagues who are defending the indefensible. There will come a day when Donald Trump is gone, but your dishonor will remain. This morning, I'll talk to one of the members of the January 6th committee, Democrat Elaine Luria, the documentary filmmaker who testified on Thursday, and a Republican congressman who defied his party and voted for an independent January 6th commission. Plus, these are the same green converse on her feet that turned out to be the only clear evidence that could identify her at the shooting. Gun safety demonstrations from coast to coast. But even if Democrats and Republicans do reach a deal, will the limited changes really make a difference? Joining me for Insight and Analysis are Amy Walter, Editor-in-Chief and Publisher of the Cook Political Report, Eddie Glaude Jr. of Princeton University, Leanne Caldwell of The Washington Post, and David French, Senior Editor of The Dispatch. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest-running show in television history. This is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Good Sunday morning. Never before in this country's history have we witnessed a president accused of a criminal conspiracy to take down the democracy. But that's exactly what we saw at Thursday's January 6th opening hearing, where former President Trump was placed at the center of the effort to both overturn the election and inspire the riot at the Capitol. We even heard of testimony that Mr. Trump suggested rioters were right to demand Vice President Pence be hanged simply for certifying the election results. The committee has begun to show its evidence. But does the country have the will or the ability to hold Donald Trump accountable in the wake of all this evidence? If this were happening in another country, what would we think? That it's strong enough to preserve its democracy and rule of law or subject to the rule of the mob? And what would the reaction be here to the prosecution of a former president who is the frontrunner for the Republican nomination in 2024? He may even be an active candidate when indicted. Shortly after January 6th, we asked, is this the end of something or the beginning? Keep that in mind as you watch the hearings. And remember that many who tried and failed to undermine democracy in 2020 are hard at work to succeed in 2024. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. January 6th was the culmination of an attempted coup, a brazen attempt, as one rioter put it, to overthrow the government. In a primetime hearing, the House Select Committee introduced its case that the assault on the Capitol was the violent culmination of an attempted coup orchestrated by Donald Trump. The committee demonstrated that right-wing extremist groups, including the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, were called to Washington and influenced to violence by Trump himself. We were invited by the President of the United States! Trump asked us to come. He personally asked for us to come to D.C. that day. Capitol Police Officer Caroline Edwards suffered a traumatic brain injury. We lost our lives! We lost our lives! What I saw was just a, a war scene. I saw friends with blood all over their faces. I was slipping in people's blood. And Donald Trump was implicated by his own advisors and cabinet members who presented evidence of Trump's calculated effort to overturn the 2020 election results. I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was bull****. And even by his daughter. It affected my perspective. Um, I respect Attorney General Barr. Um, so I 
accepted what he said was saying. More of Mr. Trump's former advisors will testify in the weeks to come, including several expected to speak to his fury at his own vice president, Mike Pence. Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts. Aware of the rioters' chance to hang Mike Pence, the president responded with this sentiment, quote, maybe our supporters have the right idea. Mike Pence, quote, deserves it. On Friday, Trump claimed, I never said or even thought of saying, hang Mike Pence. And he added, Ivanka had long since checked out. Last night's hearing was a prime time dud. No, nothing came out of it that we didn't, we didn't know before. and It didn't change anybody's minds. The question now, will our democracy hold former President Trump and his allies accountable? Already, the committee appears to be laying out grounds for a criminal referral of Trump to the Justice Department. We are undertaking one of the largest investigations in our history to hold accountable everyone who was criminally responsible for the January 6th assault on our democracy. We will follow the facts wherever they lead. And joining me now is Democratic Congresswoman Elaine Luria of Virginia, a member of the January 6th Select Committee. She's going to lead the hearing on how President Trump encouraged the mob and on what was going on inside the White House during the moment-by-moment -moment parts of the riot. Congresswoman Luria, welcome to Meet the Press. Thank you. Um, we're going to have three hearings this week. Um, I was wondering if, you could, if we could go through a few of them here. The one tomorrow, uh, Trump knew he lost and he pursued the big lie. We've seen a taste of some of the evidence here. Explain what the dive is going to be like tomorrow. Well, I think the opening to that uh, was really the first clip we showed uh, mm -hmm. from former Attorney General Barr um, that he, Former President Trump was told by multiple people, it should have been abundantly clear, mm -hmm. uh, that there was no evidence that showed the election was stolen. And he ignored that. And so the hearing that we're going to have um, on Monday is really focusing on a deep dive in that, getting into the information of, you know, what were all of those things that showed he knew this was a lie, but he continued to act on that. And he was even told before the election that he was uh, perhaps going to lose, correct? Yes. And this is going to be shown, I mean, this is... The Jason Miller segment is, is, is about that. It is, and I think that that was framed in a time frame where, you know, the week or so that we were waiting for the final election mm -hmm. results to be called, um, I think that that was, you know, he's going to lose was, you know, once this is all said and done, all gotcha. the absentee votes are counted, he's going, to, he's going to lose. It's confirmed. Wednesday is the focus on the pressure campaign at the Justice Department. We've heard some stories did, you know, was the president himself trying to orchestrate a change in leadership in order to get them to get involved? So that hearing is really going to focus, like you said, on the Department of Justice. And you know what? I think it's going to become clear across the compilation of these hearings is that, you know, this seven part plan we're going to lay out was every lever of government. They were mm -hmm. attempting to use those and, you know, whichever one they could pull and would have some influence, they move forward with it. So, you know, each of these hearings will lay that out. And, you know, there was a lot of pressure at the Department of Justice. And I frequently say, you know, if there weren't some people in the right places at the right time who did the right thing, this could have turned out very differently. And that includes at the Department of Justice, the former vice president. And, you know, this pressure campaign was wide spread. And all of these depositions are going to be, we're going to see videotape. We've, we know we see Bill Barr. We're going to see Jeffrey Rosen. We're going to see folks like that. We've interviewed a thousand people. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of those names that you know were involved in this will be part of it either via tape depositions and mm -hmm. uh, interviews or um, we'll have witnesses appearing in person across the course of the hearings as well. And then later this week is the focus on the pressure campaign on Mike Pence. Um, in, in that scenario, you've got a lot of it's, it's a, Mike Pence's chief of staff. Is he going to be testifying live? Um, well, we haven't announced and, and we'll be rolling out, you know, mm -hmm. who our live witnesses are. Um, but it's uh, clear uh, that he provided information to the committee um, and mm -hmm. that will be incorporated in what we present. I mean, when you have the former vice president's chief of staff, uh, you know, speaking to this committee and providing information about just what that pressure was, mm -hmm. um, we have information that's been you know, publicly released about right. that. Um, but knowing from the inside how intense that was, and, you know, the former Vice President, uh, Vice President Pence, I mean, he did the right thing at a very critical time. There's going to be a, an effort, there's going to be a hearing devoted to the effort to uh, find alternative electors and overturn at the state level. 
Is the actions and role of Jenny Thomas, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, we've seen a lot of evidence that she was certainly involved in lobbying lawmakers on a local level, including in the state of Arizona. Is she a part of this investigation or not? It is not the focus of this investigation. Mm -hmm. um, we are talking to lawmakers from across the country in these key swing states uh, where this pressure was applied, um, and the evidence they provide us will be included um, all of their communications with people trying to pressure them. But she is not a focus, and there has not been an effort to reach out to her to see what more, you know, perhaps even subpoena her to see what more she knows or is involved in? It, it's not the focus of the investigation. We are you know, looking at the, the plot, this wide-ranging seven-part plan uh, that the former president and his allies had uh, to, to overturn the results of the election, resulting in the violence on January 6th. I'm guessing if she had, if you thought she had a more organizing role, she'd be a focus, but it, is, that, is that the sense that she was more of a, uh, a, a partisan sort of rooter or champion of that, but not involved? Is that the conclusion? Um, I'm not sure that we've reached any conclusions. We're still ongoing investigation, receiving additional evidence, and you know, if there is something that reaches the level of needing to dig into it deeper from the committee, we've been doing that all along. Your hearing is going to focus on what President Trump was doing and not doing. Not uh, doing, especially. Uh, uh, on January 6, 187 minutes. Do you have the TikTok? Do you feel like you now know minute by minute what Donald Trump was doing throughout uh, the attack on the Capitol? Well, I think it'd be more clear to describe it as what he was not doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been reported previously that the phone logs at the White House on that day, they're missing information. Um, there is a gap there that we have tried, you know, through these witnesses. We've interviewed a thousand witnesses and a lot of people who worked directly in the White House for the president in his immediate vicinity during that day. So we've pieced together a very comprehensive TikTok timeline of, of what he did. And then 187 minutes, you know, this man had the microphone. He could speak to the whole country. His duty was to stand up and say something and try to stop right. this. Um, so we'll talk about that and what I see to be his dereliction of duty. I mean, he had a duty to act. And, and can you confirm here he never, not only never inquired about the uh, health and safety of the vice president, but also never talked with him? Um, that is um, what... We understand from everything we've gathered. I want to ask about a specific witness, Cassidy Hutchinson, um, who's a, a special assistant to President Trump, was in the White House on January 6th. It, is, is she helping to connect these dots and put and sort of plug the holes that you guys had on those 187 minutes? Um, it's a complex process to piece together. You know, you have 187 minutes, very few records. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone who has come to speak to the committee uh, that has direct evidence of that time frame has been very helpful in piecing it together. I can't say that there's one person in particular. We're going to see her um, publicly, though? We are still um, you know, working on who our panel of witnesses will be, um, and there are several who have very direct and important information, so we will She sat with you for statement. 20 hours. How many witnesses did you talk to that sat with you for 20 hours? Um, I'm not aware that there's any who uh, you know, provided quite that much time uh, to our work and effort. Uh, on the accusation that Scott Perry and other members of Congress sought pardons, um, the only name checked was Scott Perry. Um, the other members of Congress, are we looking at one other or multiple others? Um, we'll be providing that information through the, the course of our presentations and our hearings upcoming. Okay, but the allegation is out there. I mean, you guys have hard evidence that they requested these pardons? We do. And how many can you say? Is it more than two members of Congress? Um, I'm going to wait and we will provide that as part of our information that we, we provide in the upcoming hearings. Last question, and I'm curious of this. I think you guys, everybody in the committee has an idea of what happened. Who plays the, who plays the role of devil's advocate on that committee hearing? As far as you know, during quest, the hearing, yeah, during, during when you I guys are... I think we take yeah. turns, like yeah. everyone at different points, because people have different perspectives. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's bipartisan, it kind of ping-pongs back and forth. You know, different members, you know, will come in and say, well, what about this? And then other people will say, well, I'm not sure that's the direction we should go. So it's so collaborative. And in that aspect, it's different than any other committee um, in the House, because we're working so closely together and really bouncing it off of each other. Very quickly, the politics of this. You're in a swing district. <laughs> yeah. um, this is one of those things that, that some people representing swing districts are like, please don't put me on the committee. <laughs> you sort of run towards this. Why? It's that important. This is the kind of thing that will define the history of our country and our democracy moving forward. And if we can't preserve that, mm -hmm. I don't know what the country will look like for my daughter. So I thought that this effort was so important that you know if it means in November I don't get reelected, 
I can sleep. You're with okay that. if if your role in these hearings is what's used, good or bad, in your reelection. Absolutely, I'm doing the right thing. I served in uniform for 20 years. I take the oath seriously that I took the first time when I was 17 and started at the Naval Academy and throughout my entire career and again in Congress. So, you know, the work of this committee is more important than something like my own personal reelection. Elaine Luria, Democrat from uh, Virginia Beach. I, I, I yeah. got that right. Uh, thanks for coming on and sharing yeah. your perspective with us. Thank Good you. Good luck with the hearings. And joining me now is Nick Quested. He's the filmmaker who was working on a documentary about why Americans are so divided when they have so much in common. He was embedded with the radical Proud Boys on January 6th. His crew captured riot video shown for the very first time on Thursday night. Nick Quested, welcome to Meet the Press, sir. Thank you for having me. Let me start with, uh, how did you get you, uh, Mr. Tario and other members of the Proud Boys to say yes? Film us. We want this on the record. Document what we're doing. Well, um, I had a, a colleague who uh, gave me Enrique's phone number, and I called him. Uh, he and he was very receptive to the idea. He he liked a film that um, I had produced called Restrepo with my colleague Sebastian Younger and Tim Hedrington, uh, which was a film about a deployment of veterans in the Korangal Valley in Afghanistan. Um, so uh, I think the veteran aspect of the of uh, was appealing to them. How quickly did you, after January 6th did you alert authorities about the footage you had, and then how quickly did you get to the point where you were you felt legally or or ethically comfortable turning your footage over? Well. There's two aspects to that. There's the January 6th footage and then there's the other footage. Um, so on January 6th, I was very aware that we had filmed multiple potential crimes. And, um, you know, and these were on the steps of the Capitol. They were inside the Capitol. So I called a friend of mine who's a U.S. attorney and former SEAL. And uh, I said, well, I have this footage. What should we do? And he referred me to uh, the... Uh, uh, the criminal department of the uh, D.C. police, who then referred me to the FBI. The infamous video in the parking garage that, coincidentally, is the parking garage that I am using right now and in the building I, I work in here. When did you um, realize that was such a key moment and, and it was going to be a key moment legally? Because that, that is certainly evidence in the seditious conspiracy charges that both some of these Oath Keepers and Proud Boys are dealing with. I mean, we realized its importance, um, you know, instantaneously after the, the January 6th. Um, we thought it was just a, an optically bad thing to do when we were, you know, shooting it. But, um, you know, after January 6th, to see Stuart and Enrique in the same parking garage, having, you know, having met them, having sort of rendezvoused in at the Phoenix Hotel earlier, that was um, that's sort of when we really understood it to be a, 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 an optically bad situation. You uh, had been with them a couple of times in, in for post-election rallies, I think one in November, one in December, and then this was going to be the third time. I think I have that timeline right. Correct me if, if I'm wrong here. But um, when did you, you know, how often you've had interesting conversations with Mr. Tario, you had tacos with him, you were dealing with him in Baltimore. In hindsight, do you think back to some conversations and go, wow, this was, I, I, maybe I should have seen X, Y, or Z here sooner, and, and now that I've put all this together, I see it now? Uh, I, know, I, I was making a different film at the time. I was making a film about why America's divided. So I was asking much bigger questions about um, what does it mean to be American and uh, you know, and asking him for his point of view on, on certain issues, whether it be policing or health care or um, whatever the, these issues were, my questions to him were much broader. And in retrospect, if I'd have known what I know now, I'd have very much changed my line of questioning. Um, but I just want to go back. I really spent started to spend time with the Proud Boys from December the twelfth on December the eleventh okay. onwards. That was that was where we started. Um, so, when was the last time you spoke to Mr. Tario? 
Um, the last time I spoke to him was in, uh, we did an interview in Miami uh, subsequent, so it was probably in the middle of February. And then he was incarcerated for a while on the, on the, on the magazine charge and the, uh, you know, the banner burning mm -hmm. charge. And then I'd, um, I texted him and uh, I was, you know, we were discussing coming down to do a follow up interview uh, when he was arrested again. Does he still want to talk to you? Do you get the sense he's still got more to say? I don't know. I haven't I haven't I haven't reached out to him since he's been arrested for the second time. Now, on December 12th, he went to the White House. Do you what do you know about that White House trip? I know very little apart from I implored him to allow us to come with him, but he went on his own and then he returned. Did, he, did he indicate, was he meeting somebody or did he indicate he was, what, what did he indicate the meeting was about? Uh, he implied that he was going to meet with White House officials, but I don't know if he did. Um, you have become... Uh, a public figure in all of this. Um, how many times have you feared for your safety? Um, at the moment, I don't fear for my safety because I, I, my testimony is, is, is purely fact-based. I'm testifying about what I saw and I can back that up with the video that I shot. So, um, no... I, you know, America is one of the safest countries in the world, so I don't feel any jeopardy at the moment. Um, you are uh, still going to produce this documentary? And if so, how's, what's the focus now? The focus of the film is about the 64 days. You know, it, it very much parallels the, um, the committee's investigation. Um, I mean, we pivoted about three months afterwards, four months afterwards. Mm -hmm. It took us a while to process what we'd even seen. I mean, physically to process this, we, you know, my camera was broken. I'd been shot with pepper balls and I'd got into, you know, various scuffles just to, on the steps. So, which was particularly shocking because we weren't prepared for this. And, and this is in the country I live in. I'm, I'm right. used to covering conflicts abroad and I can process that and I can separate that from my life but to see it in the country I live in is was particularly um, problematic you know. can, can you answer the initial question you were trying to get answered why why is America so divided when they have so much in common I, I mean it's such a, a broad question it's you it, we could and it's so philosophical. I, I, I don't know if I can find commonality now. I think America's become so divided. I don't know if there is commonality anymore. Well, that's uh, a question we ponder around here ourselves quite a bit. Um, right. Mr. Quested, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective and experience with us. Appreciate it. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. When we come back, Republicans mostly reacted to Thursday's hearing by calling it illegitimate and a sham. But what about the Republicans who were so uncomfortable about January 6th that they wanted their own independent investigation? I'm going to talk to one of them. It's Congressman Don Bacon of Nebraska. That's next. Welcome back. Republicans mostly dismissed Thursday's hearings as a sham, partisan, and have proved nothing. But it is worth noting that there were 35 Republicans in the House who broke ranks last year and voted to create an independent commission to investigate January 6th. Now, Mitch McConnell in the Senate nixed that commission. So... How are these folks reacting to Thursday's hearings? One of those Republicans who wanted to see an independent commission was Don Bacon of Nebraska, and he joins me now. Congressman Bacon, welcome to Meet the Press, sir. Good morning, Chuck. It's uh, great to be with you. Look, I know you believe this committee is, is not balanced, uh, uh, and I also know you wanted to see an independent investigation. So I want to stipulate that. That said, uh, what did you think of the presentation on Thursday night, and how compelling did you find it? Uh, two things. One, I didn't hear a lot of new information, but I track the news every day. Uh, but there wasn't a whole lot new news uh, in that presentation. I think most of the information that we had on uh, the attorney general, uh, the president Trump's daughter was already out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I did find it interesting how many people in the White House tried to uh, compel or tell the president 
that he lost the election. I thought that was interesting. But by and large, I didn't hear new information. So that's that's one thing. On the other hand, I think the optics of having a producer, everything on teleprompter, it looks so staged. Uh, I think a lot of folks see this as really trying to change the uh, the dialogue of our country leading into November uh, for the elections. I think that that's what I hear back home uh, primarily. So uh, we would have been much better off with a bipartisan commission with an equal board, uh, half Republican, yeah. half Democrat. There would have been a timeline of when they had to co uh, complete. And there had to be consensus on subpoenas. And I thought we made a mistake on our side of the aisle by opposing that, because what we have today is a very stacked deck in the committee. In fact, the Republicans that were appointed were kicked off uh, off the committee, and I think that hurt, hurt the legitimacy uh, viewed by many. Uh, I understand what you're, you are, I think, voicing what you're hearing from some of your perhaps more conservative constituents. So I, I understand where you come from. Let's talk about what the hearing discovered, what the hearing uncovered. And I understand what you're saying when you knew a lot of this, but the American public may not have understood right. the, the piecemeal of this. Let me talk about one thing uh, that I'm curious about. This is, I'm going to play a, a clip from uh, Congresswoman Cheney, the vice chair, on what President Trump didn't do during the riot. Take a listen. Not only did President Trump refuse to tell the mob to leave the Capitol, he placed no call to any element of the United States government to instruct that the Capitol be defended. She went on to name check. check. She, he didn't call the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, DHS, the National Guard. Um, considering hearing that, uh, that was a dereliction of duty. Uh, at what point is that uh, violating your oath to the Constitution? Well, Chuck, I actually agree with you. I criticized the president on January 6th and afterwards. He had over three hours where he could have got on TV uh, or made various statements telling the uh, protesters to stop. I'm all for peaceful protest, but when you're assaulting police and when you're vandalizing the Capitol and you're defecating in the Capitol, which those things happened, it's wrong. <clears throat> the president had the opportunity for over three hours to speak up, and I think it, I think it was negligence. Uh, he should have done better. I, I didn't care for the way he treated Vice President Pence. I thought that was wrong as well. So I've, I've, I've been critical of the president yeah. on January 6th and beyond. I thought he, he should have been a better leader in this case. You think his dereliction of duty was criminal? You know, whether it's criminal or not, I'm not a, not a lawyer or judge. I thought it was wrong. And as a, a citizen, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, the American people have to judge this uh, themselves, whether it's, you know, charging someone for a crime or not, but we have to judge it just from a political standpoint. Uh, and I think, I think the American people, by and large, know it was wrong not to intervene and not to say something. Uh, we have a duty as citizens, and he had a duty as a president and as a leader. I'm a five-time commander in the Air Force. Uh, you got to speak up and, and take, take charge, and he did not. If former char charges are brought against him for incitement, it sounds like you're not going to dismiss that out of hand, are you? No, but you know he's. We, I just I look at it this way. He has already left. Uh, I think we should be looking more forward mm -hmm. on this. But but we'll see what the evidence comes out with uh, in regards to the president. I'll just say what he did was wrong. He should have spoke up. Uh, when it gets to the legal matters, I'm a little less confident on. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, you talk about you want to look forward, but he's going to. If he's a candidate in 2024, um, is he fit to be president? Well, first of all, we got the November elections. I put my primary focus on there. I do think we need a major, a new majority to serve as a check and balance. I think the American people right now look at this. It's like the 10th, 11th, or 12th priority. Inflation, gas prices, the border, crime. Those are all front and center for the average American right now. Uh, now, looking at 2024, uh, I, I think the Republicans should also look, look forward. Uh, we need someone that has conservative policies. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to acknowledge that the American people don't like name calling. They don't like the rude behavior. They like folks who treat people respectfully. And I think that's what cost President Trump in 2020. And uh, so we should take that as a lesson. Conservative values with optimism, uh, respectful uh, behavior like President Reagan, as an example. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we should be embracing. You, I understand you. It sounds like you think he doesn't have the character to be president, but is, is that fair to say that he's not fit, doesn't have the character? It's the temperament. It's how you treat other people. I think the American people in 2020, uh, the voters, 
uh, were tired of the name calling, the yeah. Twitter, uh, but they, but they by and large liked the policies. We, we have to remember we picked up 15 seats in, in the House uh, that November. Yeah. Uh, I won our seat by about five points, while President Trump lost it by eight points uh, in our district. So I think the policies, we should focus on that. Uh, but we have to also learn the lesson, why did we lose in 2020? It, it was the comportment and the temperament. And yes, a democracy respects elections. And our president should have respected the conclusion, particularly yeah. when can all you the imagine, court cases can you were imagine ever, Can you imagine ever casting a vote for him yourself again? Well, I'm going to focus on 2022, but no, I'll, I'll be looking for other candidates. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, we have a great slate of potential Republican presidents for 2024. And I look forward to being very involved and trying to get the right candidate yeah. nominated. Well, but what if he's the nominee? Is he a never for you now? You know, I'm reluctant to go there, but he's not going to be my choice in the primary. Uh, that's for sure. But here again, I, f I feel like we're missing the boat if we focus on 2024. We have 2022 in November, and we need a check and balance uh, in Congress right now to, I think if we have a Republican House and maybe a Republican Senate, it will force Joe Biden and his administration to go to the middle. But right now he is not. Uh, he's catered more to his left side of the aisle. And we, if we can get a Republican House, maybe we can get a more moderate on his policies. That, that's my, my, my desire, my hope. Uh, Don Bacon, Republican uh, from uh, Omaha, Nebraska, representative of the 2nd District. Thanks for coming on and sharing your perspective with us. I appreciate it. Thank sir. you. You got it. When we come back, Will Donald Trump be held accountable for January 6th? And if so, what's that going to look like? Analysts next. Welcome back. Panel is here. Leanne Caldwell, The Washington Post. Eddie Glaude, Jr., Princeton University. David French, Senior Editor of The Dispatch. And Amy Walter, Editor-in-Chief and Publisher of The Cook Political Report. Uh, I want to start the question this way. And David, I'll start with you. I think we're, we're headed towards a criminal referral of the former president of the United States uh, looking for uh, him to be charged as a criminal. Um, now what? <laughs> you know, it's going to be a matter of facts, law, and here's the last bit, this really important will. So what do the facts say? What does the law say? That's going to be sort of easy to discern after all this is over. Uh, in fact, it's already been pretty easy to discern, particularly in Georgia. Georgia, I think, is where Trump's conduct was most brazen, most obviously uh, implicating criminal statutes, both at the state and the federal level. But the question here, Chuck, is will, will somebody indict someone who may be announcing in the next few months that he's the next, that he's gonna run for president again and immediately become the Republican front runner for the nomination. That's where the political will comes into play. And the more the, the more brazen the facts, mm -hmm. sort of the less bold you have to be. And so that's what we don't know is how brazen will the facts get. Eddie? That's the tragic choice. I mean, the fact is, is that if we know that he needs to be indicted or he's broken the law in some way, but there's a threat of violence if you indict him. And if you don't indict him. Isn't there a threat of violence? If you don't indict him, there is the end of the rule of law. So it's the tragic choice that Mer Merrick Garland faces, I think. Leanne, what would, uh, what would we say about another democracy going through this? <laughs> well, I think that there we would have a double standard in what we would say, absolutely. <laughs> um, but before we even get to 2024, there's also 2022 and the midterm elections. And you know, I reported earlier this week that last month, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, in a closed door meeting, she told her colleagues that January 6th is not necessarily on the ballot. People are not going to go to the polls on this. People are going to vote on inflation, on gas prices. But House Democrats in this January 6th Select Committee, she says, are stewards of democracy, and so they need to do this. But I also talked to a Democratic consultant last night who held focus groups after the first hearing, and they said that they were actually quite surprised at how much this resonated with the independents. The focus groups were with the independents and how much they knew, didn't know before the Thursday night hearing and how much it, it, it really had an impact on them. And so the question is how long that sticks, right? We live in a culture where 
minute by minute, our attention shifts to something else. And we know by the time we hit November, this will feel like Johnny Depp trials a million over, miles away. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to mention that. Chuck. Thanks so much. So I think the challenge right now is twofold. One, it's it's what Eddie and David put forward about what does the Justice Department do? But it's also making the case that this is not just about what happened in the past. It's preventing it from happening again in the future, and it's also in the present. And that's the case that you're going to hear from Democrats in the midterm, especially those who are running against people who were either actually around on January 6th, in the case of the gubernatorial candidate in Pennsylvania, or who were active in some way, shape, or form, or who still won't can agree that the president of the United yeah. States was duly elected and legitimately elected. Yeah. But... To, to, to make the final case that this has to be something that's prevented in the future. When I listen to focus groups of independence, that's what they say is, I'm worried something like this is going to happen again. So this committee has to answer the question, how do we prevent that? Yeah. On, on Republicans, though, what was really telling is on Wednesday, the day before this hearing, or it might have even been Thursday, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy was asked over and over again at a press conference if President Biden was legitimately elected. And he refused to say. January 6th, he said, but now he won't. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because this is so politically treacherous for Republican-based voters, for actually a Republican leader to come out and say that, who knows full well that Biden was legitimately elected, to actually say so, it. So that's cowardly. And it's even more cowardly after the Georgia primaries. Because the Georgia primaries, you had... Yeah one-on-one -on -one confrontation between the Stop the Steal candidates and Republican establishment, including Brad Raffensperger, who did probably more than anyone prior to Liz Cheney to directly confront, and Vice President Prince to directly confront the president. And they won. They beat their MAGA primary challengers. And yet still, still, these Republicans, office holders in Washington, are retreating from that question. They're terrified of that question. And yet Georgia just demonstrated that there's a chance here to break the Republicans free. And that to me is one of the, and, 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 and a, uh, without pushing you into an answer, it, I kind of feel like the real measurement of success or failure of these hearings is how strong Donald Trump's grip is on the Republican Party in six months. Not today or in a year. You know, I didn't know Tom Rice was going to vote to impeach I don't think anybody here, Tom Rice, yeah. everybody had to quickly look up. Who's mistake. Tom Rice? We people thought it was, it was a mistake. mistake. Yes. Somebody, there are going to be a few people moved by this. They say, you know what? I'm off the train. This was horrible. Right. So I think there are folks who have made their, made their decisions, right? Mm -hmm. There are folks on the left and folks on the right. They've made their decisions. But there are these people in between, mm -hmm. or these folks in the middle that we're always talking about, these independents that we're always talking about, right? What does it mean for the committee to connect the dots? You know, I'm a professor, so what do, you know, we tell our students when you're writing your paper, tell, this is how you organize it. Tell me what you're going to do, do it, and tell me what you did. Mm -hmm. What we saw on January 6th, they, they laid out the blueprint, the general architecture, the roadmap for what we will hear. So by connecting the dots narratively, they may convince folk. But I want to say this really quickly. We need to stop believing that some of these folk on the Republican side are actually Democratic actors. Small they D, are, meaning small D. They are, they are not Democrat. They are illiberal. And when we treat them as typical opponents, yeah. we're actually contributing to the problem because some of these folks are using the democratic process to undermine democracy itself. David, we talked about this earlier. We're going to have an, a controversial abortion ruling. We have a heavy debate on guns. Um, we're not happy with the state of the world and the economy as it is right now. And we may have a former president of the United States put on trial. Mm. We going to hold? <laughs> I mean, I believe we'll hold, but I can't say with 100 percent confidence that 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 we will. Yeah. I mean, this is the reality that we're facing now. We're facing a, a degree of division. And it's not just division, Chuck. It's animosity. There's a difference between, say, Auburn and Alabama fans right. and what Republicans and Democrats are doing today. They there, there is an active degree of of hatred here. Yeah. And it's very hard to respect liberty or democracy in an atmosphere of pure hate. All right, let me pause it right here. A quick note, we're campaign junkies here, so i got to let you know about this. Sarah Palin will be advancing to the final round of voting in Alaska to replace, in the special election to replace Congressman Don Young, who died in March. NBC News says three of the final four candidates are set, uh, including a former Democratic candidate for Senate uh, and the, uh, the namesake, if you will, sign of a former Alaska politician. Santa Claus, by the way, who was actually on the ballot, does still have a chance to place fourth. 
currently in six. We've got about 22% more precincts to count. When we come back, trust or lack of trust in government. We're going to look at what Americans think is the real reason people these days run for political office. Stay with us. Welcome back. Data download time. Poll after poll finds American voters believing the country is on the wrong track. And if there's one other thing that Democrats and Republicans have in common these days, it's that they don't trust Washington to fix it. Look, at the turn of the century, right after uh, the 9-11 attack, trust in government to do the right thing was pretty high. Uh, And it was across the board. 20 years later, it is down to just 20 percent. Let me show you again. No real partisan divide here. In October of 2001, a majority of Democrats, larger majority of Republicans had trust in that Republican control of government. 20 years later, these numbers have collapsed among both parties. The Democrats, more than half Republicans, down to just 9 percent trusting government to do what's right most or all of the time. It's a Democratic government. That's why the Democratic numbers are a little higher here. But this is really troubling. Now, you might ask yourself, How did we get here? And what what do they think next? Well, it's a very cynical public. They believe right now that most candidates that run for office, they don't do it to serve the community. Only 21% think people run for office in order to worry about the greater good. 19% of Democrats think this, 24% of Republicans. Now look at the reverse. A full 65% think most candidates run for office to serve their personal interests, nothing else. And this is across the board. 66% of Democrats believe this, 63% of Republicans. When we talk about the broken democracy, this may be bigger than any polarization problem that we have. If the voters don't trust who's running for office to do the right thing, how does this democracy survive and thrive? When we come back, should President Biden run for re-election? Well, a growing number of Democratic lawmakers told the New York Times no. That's next. Welcome back. We only have a few minutes, but we have some breaking news. It appears that Chris Murphy and John Cornyn have come to an agreement on a deal to do something of when it comes to reforming our access to guns. Leanne's got some of the details. This is your breaking news. Tell us about it. Yeah, so I was just told from a source that there's going to be a deal announced on gun mental health legislation today around 11.30, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And these, this deal is going to include the things that they had been talking about, incentives for states to implement red flag laws. It's going but don't call it a red flag law, they right? Ha- they yes. have a different name for it. Yes. Um, it's much more complicated. Uh, there's going to be a separate background check process for ages 18 to 21 years old. There's also going to be a lot of money for mental health services. There's going to be money to secure schools. And so this is there's going to be uh, a clarification on who needs to apply for a federal firearm license. So that's an additional kind of background check. As a thing. dealer. For, as a dealer. Yeah, because right? yeah. there's a lot of people who are right. illegally purchasing these uh, with uh, evading the federal firearm license. And so this is big news, actually, that a deal is going to be announced today. And uh, yeah. this is what the negotiators between, you know, Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, Senator John Cornyn of Texas have been leading these negotiations. David, uh, we were talking during the break, the red flag, the phrase right. red flag law had started to become a bit politically problematic. Right. And they've got this term crisis Say it again, if you could uh, do it again. A Crisis Intervention Act, I guess? State Crisis Intervention Orders. Orders. (laughs) Okay, and and the importance of that. Yeah, the importance here is we have 50 years of study. This is sad, terribly sad. 50 years worth of mass shootings to study. And then a National Institute for Justice funded study found that in a majority of instances, mass shooters leak their plans beforehand. Mm -hmm. In other words, they broadcast their deadly intentions. And we keep seeing this time and time again. And what a red flag law or crisis intervention order does is it gives police, parents, principals the ability to say, this person seems to be in a state of crisis. They should not have a gun. And it provides an easy process, Mm -hmm. very similar to like a domestic violence restraining order that people are very familiar with, to remove guns and to bar that person from obtaining guns. And it's one thing that seems very targeted at the actual crisis we face and targeted at the behavior that mass shooters exhibit? Uh, Look, I'm not going to pretend that this is enough something for some people, Mm -hmm. but it is something. It is. It is something. But I'm just going to keep in the foreground that 11-year-old who testified, who had to smear herself in blood, 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep in mind those babies who couldn't be identified because of an assault weapon, a weapon of war that's in the hands of an 18-year-old. This is a beginning, but we have so much more to do. Uh, there was a moment earlier this week, and we had it in our open, uh, of Matthew McConaughey, who has been, he's a Nivalde, Texas yes. native. He was methodically, he spent a lot of time with lawmakers off camera. He did a couple of on-camera things, went to the White House, he went over to uh, a, a conservative cable channel, uh, and, and had the same message. And this, this feels as if at least it fits where he was, which is, hey, can we have something? Can we have some middle ground here? What'd you make of For, it? it? It's sort of appropriate that this is coming after your data download on the lack of trust in government. I know. That it, but it is. It's, a, it's important that uh, Americans can see that government can get stuff done. And it's not going to be perfect. And it's not going to stop a lot of this. And there's still more that needs to be done in terms of preventing these kind of mass shootings. But it is a start. And I think for a country that feels like all Washington does is look mm -hmm. out for itself, mm -hmm. it, it's a step forward. You wrote a very powerful piece last week. I think you titled it Gun Idolatry. Mm -hmm. is that, that, that sentiment is still out there. And there are people that believe any restriction is an attack on the Constitution. How are they going to react to this? Well, there's going to be people who are going to be volcanically angry at this, because exactly because for the reasons you described. They'll be very particularly angry at the red flag language, believing it violates due process. But again, you have to drill down and get at... There's an exhausted majority of Americans who are ready for some compromise and some progress. And you have to push past that fringe and drill down to that exhausted majority. And the red flag law in particular sell that to the American people as directly designed to deal with the exact behavior that we see mass shooters exhibit. This is a government reform that is aimed like an arrow at a very serious problem. Well, look, we were going to talk about a political problem that had arisen, has arisen for the president, which is the New York Times going public with a lot of Democratic angst over his political prospects. But I think we chose the right focus, considering that every once in a while, Let's see if Congress can act. They're going to try to act. Mm -hmm. Nothing's been voted on yet. No. Mm -hmm. And let's no, remember that. And nothing. Right. Yeah, and by the way, right. nothing's been officially announced. That's right. Mm -hmm. Before we go, I'm excited to tell you about Meet the Press Now, our new show on NBC News Now, a news-focused streaming service. We're on every weekday at 4 o'clock Eastern Time. You can watch us for free just about anywhere you find video. YouTube, Peacock, meetthepress.com. It is everywhere. No subscription necessary. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week. Because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts.